Today is the day. 31 years of dreadlocks. 31 years. Zzz. Off. Last time my hair was cut was in a swamp in Florida with a Swiss Army knife when I was 20 years old. My 20th birthday. Uh, my girlfriend at the time, who was 36, by the way, so if anyone ever accuses me of cradle robbing because I always date younger women, well, just look at that, okay? So this woman I was dating, we were on a canoe trip in this swamp in Florida, camped out, and uh, she cut half of it with the little scissors on the Swiss Army knife, the other half with the knife because neither one worked very well. And one side was a little longer, but I just like let it grow out and I never cut it since, except when I started shaving the sides 20 years ago. Now before that, in high school, I believe, or right after I got out of high school or at the end of high school, uh, my friend and I both grew dreadlocks. I lived in Santa Cruz, California. It was kind of a spot where Rastafarians would come through, like real Rastafarians from Jamaica. And you'd see those dudes with dreadlocks occasionally. But honestly, like the general public, people didn't even know what reggae was at the time. I mean, this is a really long time ago. I'm 51 right now, so I was probably 17 or 18 at the time. And I remember maybe like a handful, maybe like two or three people, even in Santa Cruz, which is like this kind of cultural spot where that, that would happen. I remember like two or three white people that had dreadlocks. I wasn't cool to almost anybody at the time and that's why I started growing them in the first place and just because I, I liked it and I thought it was cool a cool look and I was just basically going feral but I wasn't identifying with a group of people um, at the time I listened to almost you know 100% punk rock just starting to listen to metal and I was part of this you know movement punk rock movement that espoused a radical ideology punk rock is probably saved my life and it's why I ended up here doing this now and I know that won't make sense to a lot of people but you, you just don't understand what punk rock was it was this amazing beautiful uprising of a folk movement that wasn't about anything except um, ideals and ideology and rebellion. It wasn't about money, you know, shows. People never made any money. They went on tour and probably lost money most of the time. You know, you'd go to a show and it was like two or three dollars for, you know, six to eight bands. It espoused this radical ideology of rejecting herd thinking and herd mentality and trying to think for yourself and, you know, see things for what they are and not all the labels that we put on them and the, the things that we follow, the politics and the social norms that we follow that are basically just mass delusions. And we tell ourselves this story and there's this like national or global or social narrative that says this is who we are and this is what we're doing. But if you step to the side and you look at it from the side, you see that actually it's not and it's just symbolic to a large extent, and it's that radical ideology that attracted me in punk rock, and also just the music, because it was timely, and it was like a rebellion against the hippie era, which was, you know, falling to pieces, and we were starting to see, like, the, oh, these people had all these ideals, but now they're all turning into yuppies, and it's all symbolic, right? It's like peace signs and tie-dye, but you're just, uh, you know, you're not doing anything interesting with your life. So yeah, punk rock was a great American folk movement and it left an indelible mark on American culture and world culture. It affected the music, it affected the styles, it affected the thinking, and it was awesome. It was short and it burned brightly, but that's it. And this is why I am surrounded by some of my favorite punk rock albums. But eventually, like all movements, it just started to become more about the symbols and it, it was so intense and so you know, driven by negativity and hatred and, you know, angst, that it quickly started to self-destruct. A lot of kids didn't survive the, the scene at all. Like, they just, they died. They killed themselves or died on drugs or, you know, all kinds of crazy stuff happened to them because they were just like, you know, live fast, die young, there's no future. But more and more, it became more about the symbology, about the clothing, and how, how you dressed, and, and what you said, and what bands you listened to, and all that stuff. So there was an obvious conflict there. Like, that's a natural thing that happens when you get a group of gathered, people together, and they want to identify with each other in some way. But at the same time, we had this radical ideology 
of individualism and being yourself and just doing whatever. So there was a conflict there between, oh, I'm part of this group and I look like this group so we can recognize each other on the street, but at the same time saying that I am just do things, I do what I want to do all the time. Like I dress the way I want to dress and all that stuff. So it didn't take me long to start rebelling against that. And part of that for me was I, I never shaved. The only thing I've ever shaved on my face, ever, is my sideburn, like my little cheek spots here that, that grow up. Because I was basically going feral and that became, you know, my identity. And at the same time, that's why I gravitated towards growing dreadlocks. And because no one was doing it and it was different, and it made sense for me because I don't like taking care of my, like I don't understand how people get up every day and shave. That seems insane to me. I can barely keep my teeth brushed. I have other things that are much more interesting to do. So part of growing dreadlocks for me was rebelling against punk rock and, you know, growing my hair out because I would often just, you know, keep my head kind of shaved short. And more and more I was just like, I took that radical ideology and that energy and I said, okay, well this, this is not, this is not viable anymore. This is just like a thing that happened. And what am I going to do with that motivation and those ideals and that, that idea and take that and move it forward? And I did a vision quest when I was about 19 and that turned out to be homesteading. Like that was my vision. Four days uh, fasting in one spot. All I had was water to drink. I was near a creek. So I'd get up, get my water. Otherwise, I didn't move from that spot for four days and I didn't eat anything. And man, will that focus your mind and drive you inside of yourself and starting to examine yourself and think about things. And I manifested this vision of like this, this huge homestead with all kinds of fruit trees and animals and vegetable crops. And that affected, you know, the rest of my life. But that's kind of a side story. So yeah, part of me rebelling against, you know, punk rock was just seeing that it had become more about the symbols and more about the fashion. And it was kind of all falling apart really quickly. A lot of bands were starting to go more towards metal, like a lot of us were starting to listen to metal more because, uh, probably largely because it's more cynical, like it was just a, you know, that, that whole thing fell apart and we just embraced the cynicism and violence and negativity of heavy metal, which is awesome. I love metal and now I'm a complete metalhead. Notice there's no metal here. Why? Because that's not what affected me. and changed my thinking and drove me forward. It's almost like it's metals like a coping mechanism for people like me who came from this place. But now these symbols are, are ubiquitous, right? Like you can just go to the store and buy all the, the things that you want to be, you know, punk looking. Uh, when I found out about Hot Topic, I wanted to get the new Slayer album, and they're like, oh, the, the early release of the new Slayer album is only available at Hot Topic. And I was like, what the hell's Hot Topic? And I go there to get this seat, to look at this CD, which I didn't buy. I walked out of the store immediately. It was like this whole punk rock boutique kind of thing. It was just it was super depressing. And so now if, you know, my clerk at the, the local health food co-op wants to, you know, cut a mohawk and dye it, colors nobody hardly blinks they're like oh that's kind of cool you know but in the old days you'd get your ass kicked for doing that it was really really radical like everybody hated punk rock seriously like it, it was just it was so offensive to people <laughs> and that's that's what it was supposed to be of course it was supposed to shake things up kids would just get attacked and beat up on the street just for you know looking like that and now the same type of like narrow-minded people who would do that and attack whatever group now would be that radical not that the right there is one they'll grow you know their hair like that just to look cool because this is how it works all right this is how it works a small group of people that are forward thinking and think outside the box and have vision and are creative create something at first it's reviled and you know marginalized and then eventually it works its way into popular culture because it is something interesting with substance. And then it becomes just this symbolic norm where you take, you steal that culture, you take that culture and you adopt it and you say, this is, you know, I, I'm, I'm playing at being this because it's cool now. That is really what has happened at this point and that's that is what happens that's the pattern you'll see it repeated over and over again whatever 
thing happens next that's like that. Now it's you hear rap elements and um, punk rock elements and metal elements in popular music all the time. And people do the, the fashion and everything. It's just been co-opted by popular culture. It's like this idea of... Um, what do they call it? Cultural appropriation, you know? So when I see some kid like decked out in all the punk rock stuff and they're obviously just, a, you know, they're just about the look, I, I'm just disgusted by that because that's where I came from and that's how I feel about it. You know, I understand the cultural appropriation thing. It's a complex issue, but I understand the feeling of that because I, you know, I have it <laughs> too. Which brings me to the point you know, people see me and they think I'm either some brand of hippie, a Trustafarian slash Rastafarian. I've been asked that a million times. Or I'm like culturally appropriating and, you know, stealing this part of black culture because black people are who we think of as having dreadlocks. That is not the case. I mean, obviously, if, if I can grow them easily, then my ancestors grew them at some point. My buddy in high school, we grew dreadlocks, you know, at the same time. He was a Lithuanian gypsy. He showed me a picture of Lithuanian gypsies, and it looked like his, like they could be his direct family, all having, you know, the same exact dreadlocks that he had. Uh, I've heard of them from places, you know, northern Europe, in different places like peasants and stuff like that. So it isn't this idea that that's the only place, you know, dreadlocks came from. And it wasn't about me copying black people. Now, almost all the punk rockers I knew um, listened to reggae to some extent. If nothing else, because they listened to The Bad Brains. Safarians, as oddly as that may sound, and everybody likes the Bad Brains. So they would slip in these reggae tracks. I think for a lot of us it was just, it was the thing that was the cool music that you wound down on at the end of the day after listening to like heinous, violent punk rock all day long. I mean, even as a kid you can only take so much. I've had dreadlocks for 31 years. I had them even before that in high school, like I said, but they kind of were just getting underway and pretty long, and then I decided to shave them off as part of this thing I was doing. I think I decided not to do any drugs or alcohol, like no coffee, no, no beer, no drugs of any kind for like a year. I just said, I'm gonna do this from this birthday to this birthday or something like that. And as part of that, I shaved my head. And then it grew out and it was kind of like long and curly because my hair is really curly. And then again, I cut it in that swamp in Florida and I'd never cut it since, except when I decided to shave the sides. So even with that second set of dreadlocks, almost nobody knew what they were. I traveled all over the West. So like Oregon, Washington, Idaho, Montana, places like that. And people would just trip out. They were like, what the hell is that? Like, what is up with that guy's hair? And they wanted to know all the time, do you wash it? Yes, I wash it. Why wouldn't I wash it? There's this weird idea that you can't wash dreadlocks. They would just stop me at the grocery store and go, what is that? Like, what's your hair? And like, can I touch it? And I'd be like, yeah, whatever, it's dreadlocks. You know, there was no Whoopi Goldberg yet. Um, you know, pop, in popular culture, you never saw dreadlocks. The closest thing was, I think, the dude, the alien. <laughs> Remember the alien and Predator? had these kind of dreadlock looking things <laughs> on his head. But otherwise, you just didn't see it. So unless someone was somehow cued into this like little microculture of reggae, um, a lot of people just didn't know what they were. Here I'm coming from this like, you know, punk rock background, and I just went feral. Like I, I, I decided, okay, the, the thing that's relevant to me is I'm gonna move out into the woods and I'm gonna start learning how to take care of myself because I'm looking around and I'm saying, okay, this whole system is completely whack. Like we have just a bunch of herd thinking animals. The, po the politics are absurd. What am I gonna do? Like, what can I do for real? I can control and guide my own behavior basically. And 
I, I looked around and I was like, okay, we're basically a bunch of like livestock, you know, we're, we're acting like livestock. We go, you know, we go to our little pen at night and we get up and we get in our little car thing and we go to work and we punch a card and then we're given these rations and, and we can go buy stuff and we put it in our face and then we go to sleep and watch TV and get up and do it over and over again. I was like, no way am I doing that. I am not going to do that. Whatever happens, I'm not going to do that. I will be a crazy homeless person first. So I moved out into the woods and part of me just like growing my beard and hair and all that, it was just, you know, this is what the mountain men did. You know, you see these pictures of these, these mountain men with big bushy beards and hair. Well, they were just, they were out in the woods and, and, and they didn't give a damn. You know, people don't really understand what mountain men were. We think of them now as kind of like some kind of rednecks or something but they were a pretty diverse group of people and the thing they had in common is when they went out west i mean some went on purpose but a lot of them went out there for other reasons and then they just they just couldn't go back like the the taste of freedom of the freedom that was available and that was essentially me so i moved out into the woods and set up like this camp out in the woods and i started practicing you know all these primitive living skills and thinking about that kind of stuff and like how could i live where I understand this world, like the, I understand wild things and resources and what can I do with those things to manifest something that separates me from the, all that insanity that's going on out there. And that is why I'm here now. So this is an interesting exercise to have, especially in the early days, to look the way I look and be extremely intelligent and uh, a deep thinker and know a lot of stuff and interface with people. We categorize people by the way that they look. And part of my uh, rebellion was just saying, I'm just gonna do this the way I wanna do it. And I'm gonna accidentally be lumped into these groups. The worst of which is, you know, I, grow, I live in a county where growing marijuana is the primary industry. It's uh, maybe maybe wine grapes, but I'm pretty sure marijuana takes the, the bulk of the, the economy. And everybody thinks I'm a grower, and I'm so far from that. I have never grown marijuana for money, ever. The only time I grew any marijuana was last year. I grew two uh, high CBD plants, which is um, they're super low in THC, which is the stuff that gets you high and really high in CBD, which is the medicinal stuff. It turns out they weren't low enough in THC for me because I don't like smoking weed. But And I'm like outspoken against that economy and against that whole scene because I think it's gross and it has a lot of like negative social consequences. And I could just rant for like an hour just on that subject. I'm definitely not that person. You know, hippie in my household is almost always a negative derogatory term. Now that's not because I don't recognize um, some of the positive aspects of, of that culture and what came out of it and how it affected me and everybody else out there in, in ways that you may not even realize that are essentially positive. It's because the hippie culture, especially around here and what it's turned into is just disgusts me so much that I don't wanna be associated with it. So generally around here, hippie's a, a derogatory term. You know, a lot of the old hippies that I know, the really old hippies, are some of the coolest people I know. But they also espoused a radical ideology, and it's just these few ones that actually embodied that and took that and did something with it versus the people who just kind of did it because it was cool and fell into the symbology and now are, you know, yuppies or, or it's just symbolic. But I'm stubborn. I'm stubborn as hell. So part of this, well, let me tell you another story. So when I was in high school, I listened to like ACDC and Led Zeppelin and stuff like that early on, you know, like my freshman year in high school and junior high school and stuff like that. ACDC was like my favorite band back then because because it was the most radical thing that I could find. You know, I just didn't have access to punk rock. I didn't have access to anything else really radical, even the stuff that came before it. I'd, I'd never heard Iggy and the Stooges or Motorhead or anything like that. So ACDC was my favorite band. And I had like the long rocker hair, like really long, and it was super puffy. And I was just like into that. And that's what I did with my hair. And then I moved to Santa Cruz where all the kids' parents were hippies, right? But they were like rebelling and, and being like surfers. And they just gave me tons of crap. But I didn't cut my hair because I was just like, screw you guys. 
So I really wanted to cut my hair because I was just sick of it. And I waited for months until after school, the last day of school, I went home and told my stepmom to cut my hair and off. And that's when I found out my hair was curly because it was so long, it was just pulling all the curls out. <laughs> I'll tell you the main reason I don't want to cut my hair is uh, headbanging. It's just no fun to headbang without any hair. And the more hair you have and the heavier it is, the better. I remember being at a Motorhead concert once. I was just like windmill headbanging. And, and I look up and, and it was super crowded on the dance floor and everyone's standing like this. Because my dreadlocks are like this long and they're like slapping everyone in the head. Pretty funny. So that's a bummer, but my hair, I'm old, dude. I'm 51 years old. My hair just keeps getting shorter and shorter. It's, I'm not going bald or anything. I don't have bald spots, but it's just like, my beard just gets more awesome and my hair gets more short. If you look at pictures of me when I first moved here, maybe like eight, 10 years ago, I had tons of hair. And going back, you know, I had a, a really huge head of hair, but there's just not that much left. And I'm tired of it and it's bothering me and I'm just over this era. I'm also entering, you know, Steven version 7.0. I'm getting my health back. I have a new amazing, amazing, absolutely stunningly beautiful, hyper intelligent, incredible girlfriend that I'm just madly in love with. I'm cleaning up the homestead. I'm just, I'm like in the pro, I've been working up to this for months. Like I've, I've even a couple of years cause I knew this was gonna happen. I'm just ready for like the next transformation because we should be changing. I just feel that that's, you know, at least for me, I want to be progressing and we do this in stages, you know, so I'm ready for, you know, Steven version 7.0, whatever that is. And, uh, I'm tired of dealing with my hair. I'm tired of, it, of having to deal with it or tie it up or put it away or anything at all. I'm over it. So it's coming off and yeah, I'll miss the head banging, but Hey, what are you going to do? You got to roll with what life gives you. So I think that's mostly what I wanted to say. And here we go. Woo! And I'm just going to shave it. I mean, I have like the long guard on the clippers. Clippers are like essential punk rock gear. <laughs> These need to be sharpened. And then going forward from here, I really don't have any idea what I'm going to do with my hair. Right. These aren't even sharp enough to work. I was going to do this on my birthday, uh, this last birthday, or when I turned 50. I think I even thought about it then. But I guess I just wasn't ready yet. There we go. Oh yeah. And you know, I pretty much feel the same way about having my dreadlocks as I do about cutting them off, which is screw you if you don't like it. I've been told uh, you know, I would be taken more seriously if I didn't have dreadlocks. If, with that attitude, we'd still be, you know, it's, it's not 1200, folks. This is the new millennium. Now see, this I can probably manage, especially with a mirror. I knew this dude, this blacksmith named Pawnee, and he cut the scalp lock, like his head was entirely shaved, like down to the skin with one scalp lock back here tied up. And a uh, really interesting character. But he shaved his own head with a razor every morning by himself and just left this little scalp lock. So apparently much as possible if one were patient and highly motivated and willing to put in the time. I would never shave my head with a razor. I just, that's just way too much work. I, I just, I've never been fashion driven enough to do much of anything. That's why I like having dreadlocks because I don't have to do anything. About every one or two months, I have to go in and like pull them apart if they start growing together. That's like literally all the maintenance right there until I started shaving the sides. But that was really essential to do. Also having the, the uh, Dreadhawk was definitely more like representative of my uh, punk rock metal roots, you know, because when I see guys with dreadlocks, I don't always assume that they're hippies right away because I, I know about this other, you know, scene of like punks and metalheads with dreadlocks. So whatever, it's all over now. End of an era. I just wanted to cut it all off and get it over with. Get on with Steven 7.0. 
Or maybe my new amazing girlfriend will cut it. Oh my god. I have the best new girlfriend ever on the entire planet, ever. Oh my god. And even though this is probably going to make me feel crappy for much of the day, I'm going to have a beer because I don't hardly drink anymore at all. And uh, this is a time for celebration. And this is to all my old punk rock friends. Um, all of them. The ones that are still around and the ones that aren't still around. Cheers. And especially to my friend Bo, who did not make it. He did not survive this world. And I wish he had because I really want to talk to him about a bunch of things. And specifically about his philosophy of American nihilism which we never got to talk about. So, this is for Bo. Yeah, and my, uh, my brother and sister, fellow punk rockers, we had a band for a while called Bad Trip. <laughs> no, we were too busy partying to actually practice or write any good songs, so... Man, I would love to do a punk rock cover band. One of the projects I've always wanted to do. Yeah, no hair, but I have an awesome beard now. It just gets bigger and better. I'm ready for whatever. I'm happy. I'm in love. I'm getting my health back. I'm like, I have like 50% of my health back at least. I'm gonna kick some butt. I got 20 good years to do some stuff. And change the world. One video and book at a time. It's beautiful here! See you guys later. We're gonna get busy on some like skills, learn some skills. I just remember I want to tell you this story. So I was in a parking lot and this guy walks by kind of like this. He's like, cool dreadlocks bro. Don't cut him off. He's like, are you Rasta? And I was like, no. <laughs> Pretty much just like that. I'm like, no. Because <laughs> I'm <am> not, <laughs> not Rasta. He's like, do you believe in Bob Marley? And I was like, what? Did he, did he just say, do you believe in Bob Marley? <laughs> do you mean like that he exists? Or, and he's like, no, that he was like, you know, had access to like a higher power or some something along those lines. Like basically he was a prophet slash, uh, saint and i was like no <laughs> he's like all right bro <laughs> and he like cruises off down and there's also a dreadlock nod i'm so glad i don't have to deal with that anymore it's super awkward so like people with dreadlocks dudes with dreadlocks mostly but when they see someone else with dreadlocks they're like like this you know it's always up too it's never like you know it's never deferring it's like yeah yeah, bro, we know something everybody else doesn't know, right? We have dreadlocks. You're part of the same clique. I don't think you know who I am. Don't have to deal with that anymore. That's a relief. Whew. Goodbye to the dreadlock nod.
Yeah. 